My guest today is Don Loffendale, a 67-year-old retired lawyer from Canada. He's here today to tell us about a legal theory he developed and how he applied it to equality between the sexes because he felt that feminism never developed any legal theory that was actually about equality. Don, perhaps you could tell us a little about your journey to your current views. Absolutely, Mike, and thanks so much for uh, having me. I'm delighted to be here. I've, uh, I developed this about 40 years ago and uh, always meant to make it a little bit uh, public. And um, now finally is the opportunity. Before we start on it, though, before I start it, might I say uh, how much I admire the work that you and Elizabeth Hoss Hobson have done with um, Justice for Men and Boys. I think every country in the West needs a political uh, party like that. So good on you for having the vision to be the first and good on Elizabeth for uh, being a woman who's concerned about men. So that's absolutely wonderful stuff. Thank you, Don. So just before you start that, um, in 2014, I was, um, I, I, I was a speaker at the first International Conference on Men's Issues near, near Detroit. Um, and I said very confidently, with the benefit of hindsight, or you know, with hindsight, that that J4MB was the first political party in the English-speaking world. But within two or three years, most most uh, developed countries would have their own men's issues political party. Um, seven and a half years on, J4MB is still the only one. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it, it just it beggars belief, but. Uh, the gynocentrism yeah. is out of this world. And is. feminism is gynocentrism on, if not steroids, estrogen. It is, it is. So please, please Don. Can, yes, you know, thank you. Yeah. I went to a university in, um, straight out of high school in 1971. And uh, that was when uh, feminism was just um, getting going, at least up in Canada. And I was a typical um, nice guy, had a stutter, so I was a bit on the shy side, uh, but not a geek, not a wimp. I played a lot of sports. I was okay that way. Uh, but um, there were a lot of uh, feminist uh, co-eds already. Well, not a lot, but there were uh, some, and they were loud. And uh, they made a lot of noise about how sex roles were too limiting that there were uh, some women who would be better off in the workplace and some men who would be uh, better with kids. And so we should have some flexibility. So I thought, well, that makes sense in the, in the modern age, back in hunting and gathering societies where the men had to hunt long range and fight off other tribes role reversal wouldn't work, but in the modern age, uh, sure, why not a bit? Uh, they also said something I found interesting and agreed with and now deeply regret. They had a bit of criticism of men for being a little too loud, a little too dominant, a little too aggressive in discussions. Now, it didn't sound like all men, but it sounded like some men. And I must say, as a nice, got nice polite guy with a stutter, I thought there were some people, usually men, not many, but nearly always men, who wouldn't stop talking, would talk over people, and would never admit they were wrong. So I thought, well, that's a valid bit of criticism, too. We can uh, work with that. So that's uh, fair enough. But there, then there was a, an implied, if not explicitly stated, promise that if women got more stuff in the workplace, more rights, men would get more rights at home. So that if we moved at all to workplace equality, then we'd be also moving to say custodial equality in the home. Like again, at least for those couples where the, work, where the woman was the primary breadwinner, which I thought logically went with having um, traditionally male jobs and where the man was raising the kids. Well, what happened instead is you might recall 1972-73 was the time of Roe versus uh, Wade in the US, the huge, uh, very extreme um, abortion uh, 
Kreitz case, the uh, several hundred pages long, as I understand it, and I, a commentator uh, once said, you would never know that what was on the other side of the scale was a separate human life. They kind of dodged that as they, uh, as they made that decision down there. Anyway, instead of being focused on custodial equality for men, uh, Canadian femi feminists then uh, started to agitate for the same kind of so-called choice of portion rights, leaving child custody um, in the dust. So I thought, hmm, this isn't good. What was also clear is that this criticism of some men too loud, too dominant, too egotistical to ever shut up or um, admit they were wrong was just the beginning of the criticism of men. It expanded to men generally. So I, in the mid seventies already, had a class in psychology, which was my, uh, my, my major, where it was frowned upon uh, if men spoke. Like it was a psychology of women class, but um, they wanted it to be um, dominant already. So it took me about somewhere between 18 months and two years so the end of 73, beginning of 1974, to realize that feminism wasn't about equality and instead it was a hypocrisy-based, hate-filled, female supremacist, supremacist movement. So that was late 73, early 74. So then for the next 40 years, I was a voice in the wilderness. There was Herb Goldberg's Berg's book, um, The Hazards of Being Male, Surviving the Myth of Masculine Privilege in 1975. Warren Farrell's 1993 uh, book, um, The Myth of Male Privilege. And, uh, very, and those are the only two things. And interestingly, they both have a male privilege and myth uh, implied or stated uh, in their titles. And now all these years later, one of the main accusations is how privileged we supposedly are. So it went almost 40 years and then I found the voice for uh, men in 2013 and attended the first conference in 2014 in Detroit where I first uh, met you. I'm sure uh, you'd have no 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 memory of that, but it was a very uh, big honor for um, for me. And um, uh, that's it on uh, my road to feminism, and then anti-feminism. Okay, thank you, Don. That was fascinating. Um, the, the the first I heard of the. Um, the notion that feminism is the pursuit of female supremacy um, goes only goes about 10 years, but it had been said, I think about 10 years before that by man, woman, myth, Roland Ad Adelagen. And, um, uh, and uh, of course, it, something you always find in the men's rights movement is that stuff that you think is fairly new goes back, goes back way, doesn't it? You know, so we can, we, you know, um, you only need to look at uh, Belfort Bax in the 1890s, yes. basically saying the stuff that, uh, that <laughs> if he, he kind of nailed it 100 and what, 30 years ago. Yes. And uh, yeah, okay, no, that's that's fascinating, Don, thank you. And, and uh, um, for the record, I remember meeting you in, in Detroit in 14. Oh, cool. it, was, it was a wonderful event and uh, just, just met so many great people, including yourself. Okay, let me... Okay, I'll obviously edit out my mumblings. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Don, how did your friends react to you becoming the first male feminist in your group? And when did you first break with feminism? And sorry, an allied question. What, what caused you to break with it? Yes, well, it was um, just all that uh, stuff that I... Uh, I uh, um, had had mentioned that I saw it, how hypocritical and hate-filled it was, and uh, that it wasn't about equality at all, just more gains, more gains, more gains, more gains for female. And you'll note that they were talking about workplace gains 
And then the next gain uh, they wanted was not custodial equality for men, but reprodu exclusive reproductive mm -hmm. rights for women, which is a family realm uh, gain where they already have superiority. So that's kind of how I figured out they wanted uh, superiority uh, both ways. So I was in it for 18 months to two years. In retrospect, felt stupid, but for the fact, like all these many years uh, um, uh, later, most people still don't get it. They still buy it, even though it's become more and more and more and more obvious. It has nothing to do with equality between the sexes. But my the reaction of my friends was uh, interesting. At first, they thought it was a combination. They thought I was like nuts because uh, feminism seemed kind of crazy. And then just a bit of suspicion that was I doing this for sex? And uh, I wasn't actually. It was uh, kind of intellectually pure. But I will admit, the moment I became a male feminist or shortly thereafter, like after a while, I thought, gee, I've been kind of shy and just moderately or mildly successful with females. I wonder if this will help, and I sure hope it does. And I think like that shows the power of that poll, because even though my conversion was um, sincere, intellectual, that possibility immediately uh, popped into my mind. Oh, by the way, the word uh, conversion is interesting. Had a professor in family law, a family law, just in a sociology course on the family that I really, really liked. This would have been about 1974, 75, I'm gonna guess. And um, he was saying that when people became feminists, whether they were male or female, it was like a religious conversion, which is amazing. I'm sorry, Mike, you're muted. I'm doing that because there's lots of noise um, around. Don. There isn't normally, but there is. To, um, no, that's that's a that's that's a fascinating insight. It is, of course, um, it's 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 a religion of, um, of of a secular age, isn't it? A largely secular age, and. Um, and it has it has all the bad, um, it has all the downsides of religion, Don. It seems to be, and none of the upsides. Yes, um, it is. It is. Um, yeah, um, that's exactly what Janice Fia Mingo said. Well, this part is mine. It's a secular mm. religion, feminism specifically, social justice mm. generally. It's a fundamentalist religion that brooks no dissent no and no um, is resistant to any change and no nuance whatsoever and as you say all those downsides and then as janice added no upside you can never be redeemed because once you admit your badness as say a white male you're still a white male you, it's not like you're no longer a sinner you're still a white male so you can never really be redeemed. I know, and, and, and it is so utterly resistant to rational arguments. I mean, you know, men think, oh, well, let, let's, let's put out all, this, all these facts. And they're kind of, it's, it's like throwing a tennis ball at a passing train. You know, they, 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 they it, you know, decade after decade, facts don't matter. So if you take, if you take this list at the side of me, Don, this is 24 areas where, um, where the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the state, almost always to privilege women or girls. Um, there are there are uh, two or three of them which also affect um, girls. Um, most obviously, um, abortion, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and fatherlessness. Um, but year after year after year, I've been going to speaker's corner every two weeks, and in five years, you know, I'll, I'll say to them, you know. Um, I have I have twenty plus areas where the human rights of men and boys are assaulted by the state. Um, I defy you to tell me one, just one. You know, I'm not asking for two or three. I've been crazy. Name me one. Name me one area where the human rights of women and girls in Britain today are assaulted by by, by the state, by the state's actions and inactions. It won't surprise you, Don, that in five years and hundreds of conversations with feminists, not one of them has come up with an intelligent answer to that question. So it's like twenty four nil. Um, but still they're oppressed. It's like, yeah. 
you know, um, yeah, it's it's anyway. That's 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 kind of going a little bit off topic. Um, okay, Don, should, should I get to the next question then? Yes, uh, yes, I can. I should probably say when I've got nothing more to say that yeah, that uh, that's what I have to say on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, and uh, did you notice, Don, any other hypocrisy or sexism in feminism that confirmed your conclusion that feminism was about man hating? It was, it was hypocritical and it wasn't about equality. Yes, um, there was there were a um, a number, of course, the ones that I've uh, mentioned in moving towards uh, rights for women in the workplace. And it quickly became clear it wasn't kind of will become a breadwinner in a family where I, the woman, am better suited at that and all of a husband who's better suited for kids. It was, um, we'll focus only on the best, the best male jobs, only on uh, professional jobs. It was clear they wanted to force equality, that is not merit-based equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity. And it was also clear they wanted to uh, maintain um, uh, dominance um, within the... Um, the uh, family realm. So that was all uh, all bad stuff. That's the broad view. There were two or three things that were just absolutely astounded me, though, uh, with uh, feminists. And uh, f feminists seem to be expert liars. I can't help but wonder if they've been trained. Um, <laughs> Steve Brule of uh, Studio Brule, who does wonderful work, mm. Uh, refers to one of these ways of lying as, uh, I come from Sherlock Holmes, the obvious fact, where there's some obvious fact, but then it leaves out some other fact. So I refer to that as um, the lie of the half-truth, which is, uh, uh, which sometimes can be just a, uh, a pure lie. And an example of that might be if, um, Let's say if I ran to the police and said, Mike, uh, Mike hit me, and that might be true, but then uh, it'd be a half truth. Well, I hit him five times first because I was trying to rob him. Well, <laughs> puts it all in a very different context. It does. It does. But the uh, three big ones that just were so, I, I just thought they were vile lies were um, women as property uh, the supposed double standard in sex and that, um, that uh, the law, that uh, the proof we have a rape culture is the fact that the law, at least in uh, Canada, made an exception for rape within, within, uh, within marriage. So uh, women as property is an absolute myth. If one owns property that is alive, like say cattle, you have two fundamental rights. You can sell it or you can kill it. And that's absolutely not true uh, with uh, marriage um, historically. Uh, now in the modern age, uh, uh, women can kill their husbands so long as they afterwards allege he was um, abusive, but now that's been reduced all the way to merely um, coercive control. And I mean, I can see where both uh, sexes might say their spouse is controlling. I know the guys in high school who had girlfriends back in my days, that would have been late 60s up to 71, often complain their girlfriends were controlling, I think primarily on their time and that. So, but and I'm sure that can cut uh, both ways, but women as property in the sex, absolutely not a vile lie. Now, I find the double standard fascinating, and that is one, unlike women as property, which is just an out-and-out -out lie, this is a half-truth. Now, we've all heard of the sexual double standard, the double standard. Men wanted to have sex with women uh, before marriage and then wanted to marry a virgin. Well, yeah, that does kind of sound like a double standard, and it is one, but it's only half the truth. The other uh, truth that you don't uh, hear about anymore is back in those days, we knew, we were told, 
and we understood that uh, a girl, a woman, preferred her sexual experience to be with a boy or man who had experience. And that's highly understandable for, I think, two reasons. One is they're the ones getting penetrated. That must be quite nervous making, one would think. And also the fact that you kind of expect, as we still do, the guys to act and the girls to uh, react or be receptive. Well, again, you, a girl would kind of want a guy who knows what he's doing, not going to be all fumbly and nervous and make the whole thing awkward. So that's all fair enough as far as that goes. But here's the problem. How does a boy or man become experienced? Well, doing a lot of different things with a lot of different women. So what women wanted was guys to basically treat other girls and, and women badly. That's what it amounted to. But that's how he would, he would get experience by being with those girls or women and then leaving them. But once he got to her, he wanted to bring that experience to her and stay with her. Well, that's a double standard the other way. It's the obverse. But again, this reflects our gynocentrism. We actually talked about the double standard when it should have been the double standards. And both sexes and society put the opposite sex in kind of this double bind box. But the important point is that it was both sexes uh, doing it. It wasn't just men doing something bad to girls and women. I've never heard that analysis anywhere else before, but I think it's true. No, the, the, that's fascinating. Fascinating. I mean, the the um, the sort of um, standard, um, the, or the, the the requirements, I should say, um, to avoid a charge of rape. Um, I guess that really amounts to ongoing enthusiastic consent on the part of the woman. That's what it basically boils down to, as I understand. And who but a lesbian could think that that's how heterosexual sex works? I mean, by 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 that definition. 99% of the world's population is here as a result of rape. Yes. I mean, almost all heterosexual rape is, is uh, you know, is, is uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't work that way. And um, who was, somebody was um, pointing out, a, a woman recently, I forget who it was, um, was saying that um, w women would just despair at a man who, who kept on asking for enthusiastic consent during sex. I mean, talk, talk about a passion killer. Yes. Um, but it is, of course, I mean, the whole point of it is to criminalize men. Exactly. That, that, that after the acts, something that was consensual can be deemed to not have been. It's, 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 um, it's an appalling um, acts down the middle of male female relations. It is. And I am shocked about how many women have bought into it. I was talking to a guy I know who. I thought was at least purple pill, might be blue pill. And he was saying how great it was because although we have these affirmative consent laws, like he works with a lot of a lot of women and they all admit their sexuality is different. So isn't that great? And I'm thinking, no, that's awful. That's hypocritical uh, because they should be out marching in the streets or at least speaking loudly to every guy they know and all the feminists they know that don't do it that way because it's not how we are, and it's just mm. going to destroy things. But they're quite prepared to sit back in the weeds and use it as an after-the-fact uh, after power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, always, it's always about power, Don, isn't it? I mean, yes. you know, I mean, I mean, anything that feminists do or say is, is, is directed to, to, to getting you know, women um, uh, more power over men, and, and yes. feminists in particular. I mean, the employment of feminists in the rape industry and the domestic violence industry yes. and so on. Without, without these, ah, uh, oh, it's, um, yeah, okay. Thank you, Don. And anything else on, on, on that? Uh, I do have one more if we have time on this. No, 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 oh, no we, we have plenty of time, Don. Okay. No, I want to really have an, uh, more to say on the questions I've just asked. Yes, um, it was, uh, the third one was this whole thing that there's a rape culture because of the notion of marital rape and this is this one is the one that's closest to truth but it's far from the whole truth and the canadian law used to say that kind of rape was when a man had a man had sex 
uh, with a woman except his wife um, against her will. And feminists went crazy, of course, except her wife, his wife, so he can rape his wife. And so we're a rape culture. Well, the actual reality behind that is that um, uh, there, sex had a, a role in marriage, a very specific one. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I grew up at the time of sexual liberation, just on the, on the fringe of it, mm -hmm. um, language uh, failed us. Uh, the big issue was, is sex before marriage okay? And one would think, well, of course, sex in marriage is okay, but is sex before marriage okay? Well, that's an improper formulation of the issue. Sex in marriage was not okay, as in not just okay. It was mandatory. And uh, what society tries to do is to control people's sexuality by saying, don't have sex outside of marriage. If you want to have sex, get married. And then uh, it will be mandatory there. So you will have sex there. And then it'll produce some babies and they'll be in a stable family and blah, blah, blah. So you can see why that would be done. But sex in marriage wasn't just mandatory for um, wives. It's mandatory for husbands. And I recall uh, two cases on that specifically. And one was back in the day, 30 years ago or so, uh, when I read a lot of news papers, there'd be uh, small filler stories at the bottom of a uh, column when they had a space to fill. And the story didn't wrong, run uh, quite, quite long enough. And I read this one little filler story as follows. Uh, a Jewish woman in Israel took her husband to some, I, I don't know a lot about Judaism, but it was some sort of rabbinical court. And she complained that her husband wasn't having sex with her. The, this rabbinical court issued a religious decree to her husband commanding him to have sex with her because as a spouse, she's entitled to sex. Um, Karen Strawn had a story um, not that many years ago, five to 10 uh, at most, where a woman in France uh, brought a case to their civil court um, because her husband wasn't having sex with her. And they awarded her damages a certain number of francs because as a spouse as a wife she's entitled to sex with her husband so uh sex as mandatory within marriage applied to both spouses the whole reason it was um there was an exception in the canadian law um a man is can be convicted of rape uh, except against his wife is that uh, women's culpability was excluded from the law. So you didn't have to have an exception that said it's rape if you have sex against someone, uh, uh, with someone uh, against their will, except your husband or wife, because we didn't have a concept of, uh, of, of women raping men. So they didn't have to make an exception for wives within that law, like they did for husbands, because women were exempted from the law against rape across the board. So it was I, I know from, um, from, uh, from some C CDC studies, uh, and it's something that, that we explored, we, we explored um, in our, or, sorry, Justice for Men and Boys explored in its 2015 manifesto, um, sexual abuse of men by women. And it, 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 in, in straight couples in the States, the, um, the, 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 the survey showed that something like, I think about 30% of, um, uh, what, how should I put it, of, of, of sexual abuse of a partner was carried out by women against, against men. Um, and I'm not aware in the UK, I'm sure it's the same here, but there's been no survey in the UK, Don, which has asked the right questions. Because that, that's how the, some of these things work, don't they? It's not, it's not that, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the answers can't be found. But if you don't ask the questions, you don't get the answers. Um, exactly. But can, 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 uh, just, just going back to the point, I mean, there's a sort of practical issue here, I think, Don. I mean, can you imagine being the man <clears throat> um, receiving a court order that you had to have sex with your wife? 
It's like, I mean, there's nothing that would make give a man a stronger erection than the court order, is there? It's, it's... Well, there's that, but on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, like for sure, you're right. On the other hand, uh, the threat that she could do that, like how humiliating is that, eh? And, and would that would that have to be um, um, would that have to be sort of uh, penile penetration, or, or or would the man just have to sexually satisfy her in some other way? I mean, because it, it strikes me that the man might be impotent for one thing. Yeah, and also in the in the case of the Israeli uh, example. Um, you know, the, the, the man would almost be cer certainly be circumcised. Um, so, you know, he, he would have lost 90% of the nerve cells, the Meissner's corpuscles in the penis, which are in the foreskin. And I, I, I understand that uh, erectile dysfunction is, um, is, is, is high in middle-aged and elderly Jews for exactly that reason. Wow, isn't that something? That I didn't know. Yeah, I usually intercourse, like when they talk about a right to sex, it usually means intercourse, which does mean uh, a penis and vagina, yes. Right, interesting, interesting. Well, that's all I have on, on that. Thanks, Okay, Mike. no, that's, that's fascinating. Okay, let, let me just go back to the uh, questions document. Okay, so um, I think we're about halfway, no, we're more than halfway through, Don, so, so we need to sort of... Um, Sounds good. Okay, so we need to be, we need to get through the rest of them with a, with a fair, fairly brisk pace. Sounds um, good. So Don, how did your break with uh, feminism lead you to, to develop a legal theory on equality between the sexes? Well, uh, once I knew that feminism was a fraud, and that what they were calling equality was actually female superiority, I realized that um, there was no legal theory that actually was about equality between the sexes. Then in my third year of law school, 70, no, 80, 81 school year, I took a course on jurisprudence and uh, it was my favorite course in law school and I somehow had a bit of a knack for grasping uh, jurisprudence, that's, which means um, legal theory or legal philosophy. So I thought, hmm, I uh, think I can develop my own that, that could apply to um, equality between these sexes. Now, at that time in Canada, we brought in, much like the states already had, a charter of rights. So a, a charter of, um, what they call it, sort of... Um, fundamental rights and freedoms. And this dealt with things like habeas corpus was uh, constitutionalized, um, that you couldn't go to jail without actually committing a crime, uh, due process, uh, all this stuff. Um, and I thought, well, that's fine. Those were called fundamental rights and basically freed you from state interference was the belief, I thought. But there are more um, everyday things. There's rights in the everyday world, like uh, contract law and so on. I buy something or someone provides me a service. Um, I have the right to have the service performed and uh, then the responsibility to, to pay for it. They have the, um, the, the right to, the obligation to do the service and the right to get paid. So I called this theory classic rights, also sometimes known as, um, uh, which means kind of everyday rights, ordinary rights, not these big fundamental rights. Sometimes also call it R&R &R theory or rights and responsibilities of theory. And uh, the essence of this theory is that um, classic rights carry responsibilities with them, responsibilities that are commensurate with the uh, rights. So a classic example would be a driver's license. Uh, you have no right to drive on the road as is, uh, but you can apply for a driver's license. Now there's all kinds of requirements or obligations you have to perform, pass a sight test, uh, pass a uh, written test, pass a driving test. So those are all responsibilities 
But then once you do that, you have a right to a driver's license. They can't just arbitrarily withhold it from you. As time goes on, you have to maintain the responsibilities. Don't drive drunk. Don't drive through red lights. Don't speed. But again, if you do that, then you have the right to have your driver's license renewed. No arbitrary withholding of the right. So uh, that's its general application. But I thought this can apply to um, a gender equality as well. And um, I guess first I wanna kind of dodge something because I think in this discussion, it would only confuse it. I believe in equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. Uh, when feminists talk about equality, they're talking about equality of outcome. So for the purposes of this discussion, we'll, we'll know that I'm talking about equality of opportunity, but that with the assumption that equality of opportunity would result in equality of outcome, even though it wouldn't. Let's just pretend that's the case for the sake of this discussion. Um, so I think that um, uh, where we first went wrong, uh, where feminism went wrong, probably on purpose, is they made a comparison between sex or gender and race. Uh, black men don't have jobs, uh, upper middle class, uh, women don't have those jobs either, so we're both oppressed. Well, no, of course not, because the women are attached to the status of those jobs, and more importantly, the money from those jobs, lifestyle from those jobs, through their husbands. So it's like totally different. But what that got us off onto was thinking that the only place where equal rights was important was in the workplace. And that's uh, true on race, uh, not true on sex or gender. So um, the first thing that um, my classic rights th uh, theory does when applied to relations between the sexes is to note there are two spheres, domains, or realms uh, which form the basis of human existence, uh, the sexual, reproductive, or family realm, and the economic, productive, or work realm. And equal rights means then both sexes uh, or that um, both those, the rights in both those realms have to be dealt with in any valid theory of gender equality. So uh, now within that, uh, classic rights theories has two models, and that is what I call um, parallel equality, which is equality as sameness. And this is kind of feministy, men and women kind of doing the same things in life in the workplace and in the home. The other version is what I call complementary equality, uh, modern traditionalism, or uh, greater interest equality. Um, so maybe I'll deal with uh, parallel equality first. Um, and as I say, feminism is kind of consistent with that only to a slight point. It says that women are entitled to equal rights with men in the workplace. Well, let's assume that's the case. That's been their most fundamental claim. Okay, if they get that, is there then gender equality? Well, no, because they still have female supremacy in the sexual family reproductive realm. So they have what they call, let's pretend it's equality in the work realm, supremacy in the female realm. You add those up, they have overall supremacy not even a close call. But of course, they don't stop there. Because we're dealing with sex, not race, you still have to deal with child rearing and all that. So what's the feminist second claim? What's their second demand? That men must take equal, well, what's that word? Responsibility for child care and housework. So have a look at this. Family, see if I can do this. Family realm, work realm, Rights for women in the realm of work, responsibility for men in the realm of family. Well, what's missing? Family rights for men, work responsibility for, for women. Giant gaping holes, gaping holes in their theory of equality. So what that actually boils down to is female supremacy, large maximum rights, minimum responsibility, in the, in the work realm 
and uh, female superiority maintained or expanded in the family realm because they still have like all the traditional rights, right to be supported, marry men who makes more money, get custody of the kids, blah, blah, blah. But they're not there to raise the kids. They're in, they're in the, uh, the workplace instead. And they want men to do half the housework and half the child rearing during the hours that they are both home. And then still, and still want men to do uh, the traditionally male stuff like shovel snow and do the minor repairs or the major repairs if a guy's uh, got the ability to get up on the roof to get the uh, the leaves out of the trough, which is actually kind of dangerous. So they want at best equal responsibility in the in the family, but not really. They actually want men to do more when you add those traditionally male jobs and maintain female support superior rights. So it's actually superiority for women in both the workplace and the family realm. So now we're really not close to anything that could remotely be referred to as gender equality. And you so, have to say, you know, uh, as, an, as an oppressed class, they're doing very well, aren't they? They are indeed, as I used to say to my buddies, uh, if that's oppression, I want a double slice. But um, Oh yeah, speaking of which, too, way back you asked about how my, uh, my how my how my friends reacted. I should uh, slip in this: uh, forty years in the wilderness. I had maybe less than half a dozen guys I could speak to about this stuff. Um, probably more like three or four. Um, nobody bought it really. The closest they would come is they'd say, "You know, you don't realize how much you've influenced me," or "You don't," and. Uh, I'd say, and there's only about two or three guys, or maybe four at the most, that ever said that to me. And I was thinking to myself, you're damn right, I don't know, because I can't tell how it's made any difference in how you behave around your wife, or in our workplace, or anywhere else. So it was a long and lonely road. Um, uh, just dealing, if I might, with um, um, complementary equality modern traditionalism, or uh, also known as greater interest equality. And that is this, even with more traditional roles, say um, women at home and men in the workplace, at least while kids are fairly young, uh, I think that is a, a form of equality because sure, um, women had the responsibility of, uh, the family realm, but they also had the rights. They had the right to be the parent most involved in raising the kids. They had a right to be supported. And then they're, of course, they're going to get uh, custody uh, if the family breaks up, because that's what they've been, you know, been doing uh, for all their lives. So sure, they had responsibility, but they had rights. And men, sure, we had the right, not even to have a job, but to, you know, compete for a job without our race or sex being held, held against us. But then we have the responsibility to actually perform the job. And we had the responsibility to um, support our family, our wives as well as our kids, and which is, I guess, crosses over between a work-related responsibility and a family-related responsibility. And especially when... Uh, when uh, wives make up to about 85% of the spending decisions uh, within a family, uh, within a marriage, and feminists scoffed at, oh yeah, what kind of cereal you're, you're gonna buy. Well, it includes that, but it's not just that, it's also on buying a new car and especially a new house, right? How nice, what neighborhood, how big, how expensive, all that. Uh, wives have a radically, um, disproportionate say in those things as a rule so even with traditionalism as long as it's modern uh where women do get the support they need if there's a divorce and the you know husbands do bring home 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 the money so um i call that um or the reason i also call it greater interest equality is that far from uh men oppressively and um what's the word randomly or arbitrarily creating um sex role division, that's absolutely not true. It's women's anatomy that caused sex role divisions. If we were like fish and they laid down their eggs on the bottom of a stream and we laid our sperm 
on that. Sure, you know, we'd just go our separate ways or we'd go s- swim about and gather food all day, but that's not how humans reproduce. So the fact that um, um, uh, that that women are deeply tied to a pregnancy for nine months, the fact they breastfeed and especially did in historical society, like the 90% of human history that's been lived in hunting and gathering societies means that women were necessarily more tied to the family reproductive realm. Well, so they, in that sense, have a greater interest, one might say, in that realm. Well, what was left? Well, men did what was left, which was long-range hunting of large game and fighting other tribes uh, when that was needed. Uh, Women did make a contribution to food by uh, gathering grains and berries and by hunting small games like, uh, like, like rabbits or squirrels at short range. But men, the men's role was literally determined by what women had to do reproductively and how that that limited women to what they could do in terms of the productive realm. So, uh, and I think that stayed with us for a long time, such that it was always seen that women had a greater interest in the family realm and men a greater yeah. interest in, in the... Uh, <laughs> Park realm, but that could still add up to equality. I call that uh, when when women have dominant responsibilities, but also rights in the family realm, and men have dominant rights, but also responsibility in the the work realm. I sometimes call that vertical equality because the rights and um, responsibilities are stacked upon um, one another in each realm. When we share across realms, when it's um, equality as sameness, so family realm, work realm, men and women have the same rights and same responsibilities in both. I call that horizontal equality because it's across those realms. Okay. Um, Don, absolutely fascinating. I think um, we're, we're going to have to wrap up soon, I think. Um, have we, I think we've, I think you've done all the questions, haven't you? You've got, you kind of introduced stuff um, as you've been going along. So is there anything left on your list that we still need to cover? The only thing we could do, and it might take too long for this, so we don't have to do it, is the specifics on uh, what constitute rights and responsibilities in both those realms and how things have changed because they've actually gotten worse for uh, men in both, not better in either. But, you know, this might be enough for one chunk and maybe some other time we could get into the real nitty gritty because while I think this is logical and principled, I have read, and I think it's true, the first time that people hear something that's brand new, they don't get it, no matter how logical it is, no matter how rational it is. So this might be a plenty big enough chunk for, yeah, for people. No, that, that, that was fascinating, Don. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Sorry, Mike. Uh, just before you start, I would like to say I'd like to dedicate this interview to a fellow. Um, lawyer in the movement, our dear friend, Mark Angelucci, who was murdered, perhaps assassinated, and a wonderful man. I only only met him a few times, but I adored him and I admired him. I think he was the absolute best. He was. He was, um, it was, it was like, uh, I think for most people in the men's rights movement, Don, his, his murder was like being hit by a freight train. It was, you know, people were going around in a daze for, for some. Now, he was a wonderful man. I met him a few times. Um, one of the most charming people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. And he also yeah. did, some, did something, uh, you know, he, was all, he also had legal successes. Yes. Which, which, is, which is not something that you can say that, that the men's rights movement has had much of. He was um, the only one, really. The only one. Yeah. And he was almost certainly killed by that uh, man who resented his 
um, I, I think his work on 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 the draft, or yes. have I got that wrong? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, we, we, you know, hopefully we'll find out. Anyway, Don, thank you so much for contributing to this conference. That's that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. we, we have 120 speakers, and nobody is covering <laughs> uh, the territory that you've just covered. So that's a, that's a great that's a great piece of the jigsaw. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the inv invitation, Mike. It's absolutely been my pleasure. And I look forward to seeing you um, on Regarding Men. Um, for sure. Which, which uh, I, I just love doing, doing those 90-minute uh, those things every Sunday. Good. I think it's a wrap, Don. <laughs>